Dung beetles are incredibly important animals because they're at the bottom of so many of our food chains. You know, they're responsible for um, recycling material back into the soil, so they're very, very important for soil health. They're a, a massive part of our ecosystem. We've got 800 species in South Africa, which most people don't realise. And they have all sorts of interesting behaviours. One of the ones that we research is looking at their orientation behaviour. Orientation behaviour by dung beetles would appear to be very, very simple. Make a ball, head off in a particular direction. But if you yourself try to orientate in a completely featureless landscape with no clues from the outside, so no visual information, no oral information, you would go around in a circle. And that's really what we all orientating animals need, is we need some sort of fixed point that we can orientate our bodies towards. Now, as humans, we often use landmarks. Um, so you know the way home, you know where the shops are, you know where the church is, you know where the pub is, you know where the car park is. And you can, even in your own mind, orientate yourself within that map in your own head. That takes a lot of brain power. Beetles don't have very large brains and they haven't got the space in their brain to accommodate that sort of information. So instead they use what we call celestial cues, cues in the sky. Every now and then the beetle climbs on top of the ball, it does a little 360 on top of the ball and what it's doing is it's scanning the sky and it's picking up those celestial cues and in that dance it takes a snapshot of the sky and then heads off in the direction that it wants to go in. So amongst those cues we've got the sun, but we've also found out that the beetles that roll balls at night also use the moon. But then the moon is not always available, because sometimes the moon has set or it's a full moon, a new moon. Um, and in those circumstances they can use the stars in the sky. So those are the celestial cues that we are aware of. And then there are other cues in the sky that we're not aware of because we can't see them. So for instance, there's polarized light in the sky that our eyes can't detect. But we can prove that dung beetles can use that polarized light by giving them light through a polarization filter and then we turn the filter and if the beetle makes the same sort of turn then we've proven that that beetle is also using polarized light as a, a cue. Now what we've found just recently is that not only can they use these visual cues, but they can also use a mechanosensory, a, a, a touch, effectively, um, feel of where the wind is. And this is really clever, because if you think about the sun as a cue, when it's at the horizon or low in the sky, it's very obvious if you turn your body to its position. But if it's right in the top of the sky at midday, if you turn your body, you're not aware where it is relative to the sun because it effectively hasn't moved. And so at this time of day, the beetles will actually use the wind as a, an additional compass. And that improves their um, compass ability, is that they actually have a wind compass that they can detect with their antennae. This animal is able to integrate information through, from two completely different sources a mechanosensory thing from its antennae that it's feeling and a visual sense from its brain and it's able to balance those two inputs. And that's something that our computers at the moment battle to do. And if you think about when you arrive at work or you want to send an email somewhere and the computer boots itself up and it's determined it's going to run through a whole load of programs or check the inbox before it allows you to um, send out a mail. Even with our superb computers as they are, they have great difficulty in knowing what is the most important thing at that given moment in time. And here's this beetle with this tiny little brain is able to say, drop that piece of information, pick up this piece of information. But the trade-off of this is that we can then take these systems into our artificial intelligence systems and into our computer systems and say, well, how does an insect with minimal computing power cope with these different sources of information? And how can we possibly bring this into our um, AI systems and our computer systems and mimic what the beetles are doing? 
And so what we're doing now is seeing if we can mimic that in a, in a robot. And we're asking the robot, can you use polarized light to find an orientation direction? And then can you follow that direction um, with minimal computing power on the part of the robot? So that's the simple stage that we're at at the moment. I think the exciting part of the into the AI story is where we bring in our wind um, and sun compass is it's that integration of those two sources of information and having a system that is able to select which is the most important piece of information at any given time and match that to the map that is in this beetle's head and allow it to head off in a particular direction. Dung beetles have fascinated and entertained me and provided me with work for 30 years and our new paper is exciting but it literally is just part of a, a long journey that has been going on for the last 30 years. Myself and a colleague have just produced this book in which we um, use dung beetles to actually trace the history of science. And so these little animals with their tiny brains have been able to contribute to science from the Egyptians, literally, through to present day robotics and genetics for, that's getting on for 5,000 years. That's pretty good. <laughs>